To an animal lover, venturing into the world of zookeeping might seem like a dream come true. However, these magnificent animals, despite being in the zoo, remain wild at heart, and their unpredictability has led to several fatal attacks and maulings. Despite the rigorous safety protocols and extensive training, the bond formed between keepers and the animals can sometimes blur the line between trust and peril. Hit that like button and subscribe right now. In today's episode, we go over three of the most terrifying times a zookeeper was fatally mauled by an animal in the zoo. Welcome to Final Affliction. Diana Hansen was fascinated by lions, tigers, cheetahs, and leopards. She had the privilege of getting up close and personal with them during visits to wildlife parks. Her Facebook page was littered with photos of her next to these incredible animals. Big cats were her passion. Since Diana was three years old, she had loved big cats. Now, just over 20 years later, she landed her dream job working as an intern at a big cat sanctuary in California. She was learning the ropes, learning what it took to keep some of the world's most magnificent predators in captivity. Her ultimate goal was to work in a zoo one day. Securing this internship was one step closer to that goal. She had spent time with captive tigers and lions during her studies at Western Washington State University and had visited Africa to see lions in the wild. Now, she was working at Cat Haven in Dunlap, California. The reserve was run by Project Survival, a privately funded education and conservation organization. The reserve covered an area of 100 acres and was home to tigers, leopards, lynxes, and other endangered big cats. The park was used for educational purposes to advertise the importance of these species as populations of their wild counterparts dwindle. As well as day visitors to the park, they also offered outreach programs, during which staff would visit schools and places of work with the big cats to educate and inspire people. 24-year-old Diana was instantly likable amongst the staff. She had an infectious enthusiasm about her work and was devoted to the big cats. She would make up songs about each of the animals she worked with, she loved being at the reserve and working with the animals so much that she requested that she could bring her parents to work to give them a tour. The staff accepted, and a few days later, Diana eagerly showed her parents around the reserve. They visited the tigers and then the lion enclosure. Inside was a male African lion named Couscous. He was four years old and weighed 500 pounds, 220 kilograms. He was handsome and striking a favorite amongst visitors to Cat Haven, a favorite of Diana's. Diana's father knew the dangers his daughter was facing each day she worked at the park. He knew the stories of captive animals turning on their keepers, and he had a feeling that it may someday happen to Diana. It was almost a premonition. He imagined the phone call he might receive, the devastating news waiting for him on the other end of the line. But Diana was happy. She enjoyed her work. She had been working there for two months. She followed the safety protocols and knew the safety procedures when working with the big cats. On the morning of March 6, 2013, Dale Anderson, the owner of the park, left with two other workers for an outreach program. He was taking a cheetah to show children at a local zoo. It was a standard procedure. The staff that remained at the park, including Diana, continued with their jobs. Meg Pauls, an employee at Cat Haven, worked with Diana. The two took their usual route around the park, each of them assigned to a different section. They had a golf buggy to move around the park. With them, they carried food for the animals and equipment to clean the enclosures. As Meg went one way, Diana went the other. They would then meet at the end of their route and ride back to the staff room in their golf buggies together. This particular day was different, however. Diana's boyfriend was visiting from Italy. Diana had invited him to come and spend the day with her at Cat Haven. Maybe she wanted to prove herself to him. Maybe she wanted to show him just how majestic these animals were, or how good she was at her job. 
Nobody knows for sure why she did what she did. That morning, Couscous had already been fed. Just after midday, Diana entered the lion enclosure. She knew that she wasn't supposed to go in alone. Usually, two or three staff members are on site when somebody enters the pens. And as for Couscous, only Dale was ever allowed into his cage. But Diana knew where the key was. She also knew how to shut the lion in the small section of his enclosure while she cleaned the larger area. The section she locked him up in was the feeding section. He had already been in there once that day. There were four sections to the enclosure, one for a person and three for the lion. Each was securely fastened. There had never been any incidents or malfunctions on the gates or enclosures since the park was founded in 1993. The system seemed to work well, and all staff were adequately trained before working with the animals. Diana was sweeping the floor and scooping up the manure. She was emptying it into a large wheelbarrow when her walkie-talkie crackled into life. It was Meg. The two chatted together over the radios as Diana took a break from her chores, but her back was turned to Couscous. She was completely oblivious to the fact that she'd failed to close the gate partitioning the two sections. She had also failed to notice Couscous watching her with intriguing eyes. He nosed the gate and reached up with his paw. To his surprise, the gate moved. He nudged it again, and the gate swung open. He was now just feet away from the enthusiastic worker, and he stepped forwards. He was excited, curious. He sniffed the air as he placed one of his huge paws into the section of the enclosure that Diana was in. Slowly, he placed one foot in front of the other. To him, this was just a game. Living a life of solitude, he wasn't used to sharing his pen with anyone. He had been raised at the park since he was eight weeks old, just an energetic bundle of fur. But now he stood tall, an impressive mane and powerful body. He leapt at Diana, swiping her head with his paw. Diana crashed to the ground. In that instant, she was dead. The hit from the lion's paw had snapped her neck. She hadn't seen the attack coming. She hadn't felt any pain or suffering. One second she was talking on the radio, and the next, she was gone. Meg, on the other end of the radio, called for Diana. She thought it was suspicious for the conversation to suddenly drop, but continued working. She had finished her section of the park, and now she waited for Diana, but there was no sign of the intern or of her golf buggy. Meg drove around to the lion enclosure where she noticed Diana's golf buggy parked beside. She immediately spotted Diana lying on the floor of the enclosure, just beside a bush. She thought she must have fainted and called out to her. There was no response. Then her heart leapt in her chest as she noticed Couscous out of his small pen. There was nothing between the enormous lion and Diana. Calmly, Meg tried to talk to Couscous. She tried to keep him away from Diana's body whilst she hurriedly called 911. Emergency services arrived on the scene. Police officers tried to lure Couscous away into another enclosure with food so that the staff could reach Diana's body. But they were unsuccessful. The lion began acting aggressively and defensive over Diana's body. It growled and made lunges towards the emergency responders. Although Diana was unresponsive, they still needed to get the lion away from her if they were to have any chance of reviving her. At that time, they didn't know she was dead. They didn't know what had happened. Less than 30 minutes after Diana entered the lion enclosure, not only was she dead, but Couscous was shot dead by the Fresno County Sheriff's Office. It was now time for the sheriff to make that call to Diana's father, the call he had long been predicting, the call he had been dreading. The family were distraught. They were heartbroken at losing Diana so young. Their only comfort was that she died doing what she loved. Her father acknowledged that she likely died instantly, possibly without even seeing the attack coming. It was not a long, drawn-out attack. She did not suffer, and that provided some comfort for them. There is very little information about why exactly Diana went inside the cage that day. Her boyfriend has never come out with any information confirming 
if he saw what happened or if he was with her during the attack. Investigators concluded that the connecting door between the two sections of the enclosure had not been securely fastened. They walked Diana's father through the most likely scenario. It seems that she was distracted at one crucial point and failed to securely fasten the gate. It also seemed that Couscous leapt on her in a playful way, but his strength had broken her neck in an instant. There were no markings to suggest a mauling had taken place, no scratches on her body, just a broken neck. He hadn't even bitten her neck, but it had been broken, apparently, from just one swipe of his paw, a swipe that, in the wild, can be used to take down an antelope, knocking it off its feet. Although he was raised in captivity, Cusco still had the raw power of any lion, a deadly raw power that led to Diana Hansen's unfortunate final affliction. 24-year-old Patricia Wyman thought she had landed her dream job. She had applied to work at Halliburton Forest and Nature Reserve in Ontario, Canada. The position was for a caretaker of the North American Grey Wolves. When she was accepted and welcomed onto the team, she was delighted. She had always been fascinated with the species and working with them was going to be exhilarating. Halliburton Forest covers 100,000 acres and comprises millions of trees and more than 100 lakes. It offers members of the public ecotourism experiences in an incredible piece of Canada's wilderness. It is a sustainably managed forest which includes a research facility and education center. With the aim to educate people about wolves, they built a wolf center and introduced their first wolf pack in 1993. They have always tried to keep the wolves as wild as possible, allowing them to exhibit semi-natural behavior. There is no human interaction with the wolves and visitors can only view them through the one-way glass. The only time they see human beings is at feeding time. Patricia had recently completed her undergraduate degree in wildlife biology in the University of Guelph in Ontario. When she arrived for her induction, her supervisor warned her of the dangers of working with wolves. They had been in captivity for their entire lives, but they were not socialized with humans. That's the way the reserve wanted it to be. The wolves were free to roam their 15-acre enclosure. When the caretaker took them their food, the wolves would hide away. They were timid and shy, just like wolves are in the wild. They kept their distance from humans and had never given the staff any reason to be overly concerned. Patricia was introduced to her work routine, which included educating the public, giving talks, and caring for the wolf pack. She was taken into the wolf enclosure and shown where to feed them. The following day, she was tasked with feeding them alone. As Patricia unlocked the gate and stepped inside, she felt an uneasy feeling wash over her. She looked around, but couldn't see any of the wolves. She walked purposefully to spot where she dumped the food. She set it down, but when she turned to leave, she noticed the alpha male watching her. The way he was standing sent alarm bells ringing. The hairs on the back of Patricia's neck stood on end. He wasn't timid like the rest of them. He was eyeing up this new member of staff. He was sizing her up. His manner was odd and something about him unsettled Patricia. When she returned home that evening, she recalled her day's events to her fiancé. She was excited about her new role, but also mentioned her apprehension when it came to the alpha male in the pack. Although Patricia had clearly been unsettled by this particular wolf, she didn't share her concerns with her supervisor. Being new, perhaps she didn't want to cause a fuss. Maybe she was wrong about him anyway. The staff at the center had never raised any concern about him before, but Patricia's instincts were right. There was something about the wolf's behavior that was worrying. Something had triggered a behavior change in him, and with her expert knowledge and understanding of wolf behavior, Patricia had noticed it. The following day, on April 18, 1996, Patricia entered the enclosure once more. This time, she wasn't there to feed the wolves. The wolves were only fed once every five days. In fact, no one knows why Patricia went into the enclosure on her own that day. 
and no one knows exactly what happened next. But Chief Investigator Eric Klinghammer came to the following conclusion. Patricia unlocked the gate to the wolf paddock. The metal framework clanged behind her, alerting the wolves to her presence. For some reason, she wanted to see them in their enclosure, but they weren't close enough to the fence. The paddock was littered with fallen trees. They lay scattered across the grass. Patricia stepped over them as she searched for the wolf pack. She had only walked through the enclosure a little distance before she came across them. Five large adults lying down in the grass. They were already looking in Patricia's direction. They had already heard her. They had already smelt her. When they saw Patricia approach, they stood up and pricked their ears. Patricia stood still. She didn't know whether to stand and face them or retreat slowly. She had been told that they normally flee when they see a person in their territory. They were normally hesitant, but not today. As Patricia stood there, frozen to the spot, the wolves walked forwards. They started to surround her, circling her. Patricia was trapped. She must have felt fear. She must have panicked when she saw them advancing. Her adrenaline would have surged as the telltale signs of an imminent attack grew. Her heart thundered in her chest. The wolves stepped forward once more. Their eyes locked onto the young woman. The alpha male approached. Patricia stepped backwards. As she did so, she tripped over a fallen tree and fell to the ground. That was all it took. One single trip and the wolves seized the opportunity to attack. In a second, Patricia felt the weight of one of the wolves on top of her as she scrabbled about on the ground. She knew she was in big trouble. She knew this was it. She tried desperately to get up, but the wolf was joined by more. In a frenzied attack, the pack bit her all over, clamping their jaws around her legs and arms. Pulling her limbs in all directions, she felt the tearing of skin and muscle. She put up a brave fight, trying to lash out and fight them off. But there were too many of them. Each weighing up to 175 pounds or 80 kilograms, they were strong and powerful. Their sharp teeth and jaws, designed to subdue and kill their prey, can crush bone. Patricia felt herself grow weaker. As she lay there, she tried to cover her neck and head. She had no more fight left in her. She was bleeding heavily. Patricia died that day. It was only her fourth day in her dream job. Her years of study had built up to a job like this and it ended so brutally and tragically. To their shock and horror, two employees of the reserve found Patricia's body that afternoon. They immediately phoned the Ontario Provincial Police who rushed over. Two officers drew their weapons and entered the enclosure. As they made their way over to Patricia's body, they saw the wolves standing guard. But they hadn't eaten her. A few bites had been taken from her extremities, but her torso was largely untouched. The savage attack had ripped the clothes from her, and multiple bite marks suggested at least five wolves had piled in on the attack. Maybe more. As the officers stepped closer, one wolf lowered its head, fixed its eyes on them, and let out a deep, menacing growl. This behavior was a sign that it was protecting its kill. The officers then noticed another wolf step forward, and then another. Gradually, the two policemen were being circled by wolves. They were surrounded, just as the wolves had done with Patricia. Outnumbered and not sure of the wolves' intentions, the officers fired a couple of warning shots in the air. The loud bangs shocked the wolves and sent them running. The two officers fled the enclosure and called for backup. When more officers arrived at the center, six entered the paddock to retrieve Patricia's body. They did so without further incident. The investigator, Eric Klinghammer, suggested that the reason the wolves had not eaten Patricia was because they tend to avoid unfamiliar food. His conclusions of what happened on that fateful day came from over 25 years of experience studying and working with wolves. He also had extensive knowledge of wolf behavior and attacks on humans by both wild and captive canines. 
It was tragic that such a young and enthusiastic woman lost her life doing what she loved. We will never know why she entered the wolf enclosure that day. Maybe she innocently wanted to observe their behavior close up. But where there are predators, there are always dangers, and this time it led to her unfortunate final affliction. Sam Mazzola was a well-known controversial figure born and raised in Ohio. From an early age, he showed a passion for collecting and caring for animals, which eventually turned into a hobby. As he grew older, Sam became more and more interested in the exotic and unusual, and he began collecting a variety of exotic and dangerous wild animals. Over time, Sam's collection grew to include a wide range of creatures, including lions, tigers, bears, and wolves. He became known throughout the community as an expert in the field of exotic animal care, and he was often sought out for advice and assistance by others in the industry. As his reputation grew, Sam began to exhibit his animals at fairs, festivals, and other public events. He would bring his exotic animals to these events, allowing people to get up close and personal with these majestic creatures. He believed that these exhibitions were an important part of educating people about the importance of wildlife conservation and the need to protect these animals from extinction. However, although he claimed he loved and treated the animals in his care well, there were a lot of controversies surrounding him. One of the most significant of these controversies involved allegations of animal mistreatment and neglect. Sam had been cited numerous times by the United States Department of Agriculture for violations of the Animal Welfare Act, including failure to provide adequate veterinary care, unsanitary conditions, and failure to provide animals with appropriate food, water, and shelter. In 2009, Sam's USDA license was revoked and he was fined $21,000 for violations. However, he was allowed to keep his animals. He also pled guilty in federal court to taking a black bear to Toledo without a license and selling a skunk without a license. Additionally, many of Sam's neighbors complained about his practice. The animal noises at night, the howling and barking were all disruptive to the community not to mention the danger that these wild animals pose to the neighborhood if they escape. Nevertheless, Sam continued his exhibits and would even let people pay him to wrestle a black bear. Unfortunately, the dangers and risks of keeping exotic wild animals would soon come to light in a tragic way. Ever since a young age, 24-year-old Brent Kandra loved the outdoors. He would spend long summer days exploring the creeks and rivers of northeastern Ohio, discovering new fishing spots. One of Brent's favorite pastimes was baiting bullfrogs with a blade of grass and catching large carp. For Brent, being involved with animals was more than just a hobby. It was a way of life and an opportunity to connect with nature. He would often spend weekends camping near the river surrounded by the tranquility of the great outdoors, and would always have a pet snake, a turtle, or a dog. Consequently, Brent's family helped cultivate this healthy love for animals. Unbeknownst to them, this would be the cause of his demise. When Brent entered his 20s, he began to tend to dogs and feed bears by working with Sam. Naturally, Brent's father wasn't all that enthusiastic about this idea, as Sam had problems with paying on time and keeping his word on the agreed payment terms. Additionally, Brent's father was worried about the risks involved in handling wild animals and feared for his son's safety. Still, Brent deemed this a better job than selling cell phones at the mall. Still, Brent would go against his father's advice and keep his job at the Mazzola property. Unfortunately, the fears of Brent's father would become a reality on August 19th, 2010. It was Thursday evening, and Brent was preparing for the animal's routine feeding. The 24-year-old caretaker had developed a deep bond with Bart, the massive 500-pound black bear residing on Sam's property. As the sun began to set, Brent made his way to Bart's enclosure carrying a bucket of raw meat that he had carefully prepared earlier in the day. 
The bear had grown accustomed to the sound of Brent's footsteps, and he stood up on his hind legs as soon as he heard him approaching. In his earlier days working with the animals, Brent was nervous around Bart. However, through time and in being around the animals so much, Brent believed he had gained their trust. Still, he knew that the key to working with wild animals was to show them respect, so he always approached Bart with a calm and steady demeanor. Slowly, he unlocked the door to the enclosure and let Bart out. Growing accustomed to Brent, this was a normal occurrence for Bart, being fed outside of his cage. Brent had been working on Sam's property for a long time, and he had developed a deep connection and confidence with the animals, but he never expected that this love and fascination would turn deadly. Without warning, Bart suddenly lunged at Brent, grabbing him with its powerful arms and sharp claws. Brent tried to defend himself, but the onslaught of a 500-pound black bear was too much. Within seconds, Bart had taken Brent to the ground and began mauling him, biting him in the face, head, and arms. Brent could feel the intense pain and hear the roar of the bear as it viciously attacked him. He struggled to break free, but the bear's grip was too strong. Bart's sharp claws and teeth punctured through his skin and muscles, breaking the bones in his hand. Brent was no match for the powerful animal as it swiped at his chest, breaking his ribs. As the attack continued, Brent's mind raced with thoughts of survival. Bart's teeth punctured him all over his body, making him lose a lot of blood. Sam, who was also on the property, saw what was happening and began to intervene. He shouted at Bart, making noise and hoping the bear would be distracted or scared off. While Brent's screams echoed in the background, Sam scrambled for a solution. He picked up a fire extinguisher, pointed it at Bart, and forced the ferocious creature back into its cage. 911 services were immediately called, and Brent was taken to Metro Health Medical Center. Unfortunately, the next day, at approximately 1.30 a.m. on Friday, Brent succumbed to his injuries and passed away. The coroner said that the cause of death was sharp and blunt injuries to the body, consistent with a bear attack. According to Sam, during an interview, he was the only one to witness the incident. He declined to go into detail about the attack, but did mention that Brent was Bart's favorite caretaker. Sam also mentioned that it would be up to the family to euthanize the bear as he would respect their decision. However, he also mentioned that Brent would not have wanted the bear to die and that the bear loved Brent too. However, Brent's father and his ex-wife wanted the bear to die. Eventually, they went ahead with it and Bart was euthanized by a veterinarian. In a strange twist of events, Sam was found lifeless in his home in 2011. He was handcuffed, face down on his waterbed, and wore a leather mask that covered his face. The autopsy revealed that he died through asphyxiation with a bedroom toy lodged in his throat. Unfortunately, because he was left in the room alone, nobody could hear his cries for help. The circumstances surrounding his death is still a mystery. After Sam's death, the animals on his property were sent to various individuals and facilities across the United States. Sam's untimely death put the case of Brent's fatal attack to a closure. Although dangerous animals like tigers, bears, and wolves are beautiful animals, owning these kinds of animals can have fatal consequences. Despite the 500-pound black bear having a good relationship with Brent for years, he suddenly snapped, leading to Brent's terrifying final affliction.